of our DNA. Enrique lives and breathes the high-tech mission. Uh, he is the Global Vice President for Sales and Development, SMB, and Digital to Direct in North America. He helps his customers find success by streamlining the agreement process in a smart, easy, and trusted way. And Enrique is the epitome of integrity. He volunteers his time for entrepreneurs throughout Latin America to get them up and moving, and in so doing, create generational wealth. Um, he lives in the Bay Area with his two children, wife and dog. And one thing that Enrique and I have in common that we are absolute fanatic readers and skiers. So mil gracias, welcome to High Tech Live. But before we get started with what an authentic leader looks like and making room at the table, first we're gonna watch this video so that we're all on the same level. Thank you. Roy, when you get a chance, let's run the video. Again, while that's happening, if you have any questions, feel free to add them into the chat. We need the volume, Roy, so if we can start it from the beginning and add the volume. And also, if you wanna do a high-tech check-in in the chat, that would be great. I will start us off. So a high-tech check-in is very easy. Uh, it's your name, title, company, and most importantly, where you're from. And Roy, maybe you need to go off mute. Sound okay? Let's see. Okay. It wouldn't be a high tech live without some technical difficulties, but we will walk through them. We can't hear the volume, Roy. Fred says, when sharing video, be sure to enable audio. I think we did that before. Thank you, Fred. We just actually ran the video 10 minutes before going live. So it's one of those things. Susanna, would you like me to try? Yes, please, Aisha. All right, let's try this. If it was me doing it, I'd be saying for sure it's user error. What are Latino jobs? But the stereotype here, of course, is that you're, you build fences. Well, I don't know. What's anybody's job? You know, janitorial or the carts or the corn. I'm in the construction business, so a lot of construction. Construction. Uh, roofers, lawn. Jobs that don't require a high level of education. Unfortunately, I think construction, which is really sad, actually. But that's the first thing that comes to mind. I'm a thermal engineer. I'm a software consultant. I'm a bilingual media professional. There's no such thing as a Latino job. I think a Latino job is anything a Latino wants. Anybody can do whatever they want. I was a politics major. I have a degree in neuroscience. Cum laude, a bachelor's degree in international business. It's in our blood to work hard and to put so much passion into our work. I am bilingual. I do magic with computers. I don't want to be the one who just fixes things, but creates them. A Latino job is whatever that Latino wants to be. It's as simple as that.
Thank you, Aisha. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, it, it won't be a high tech event or it won't be a any sort of meeting in 2023 without technical difficulties. So, but as true Latinos and minorities, we just roll through it and make it happen. So that's what we just did. So thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Susana. It's great to see you again. Uh, can't wait uh, to see you again in May and hang out and uh, we should go skiing sometime. Um, and it's just it's just an honor and a privilege to be here again. Um, used to set the context of the conversation that uh, that we're having today is in November um, of last year. <laughs> Sounds like a million years ago. I, I had the honor to be invited uh, to talk at the High Tech Summit uh, in New York. And the topic of the conversation, uh, it was more of a reflection of how do we, you know, as you know, the mission of high tech, how do we push up and how do we pull up great talent? I'm thinking about systematic ways and, and programmatic ways in which we can do that for each other. Um, when I got the invite, I started the reflection process into how, how did I get here, right? Um, where I am as a Mexican immigrant working in tech in the Bay Area. And through that, I realized that the reason why I'm here is because I am a combination of incredible privilege and luck. I, I've been privileged to have parents that prioritize that I learn English, right? That prioritize my education and always encouraged me and gave me the means, although they didn't necessarily had extra means, but they prioritized, you know, the fact that I, I needed to get educated and I needed to learn English. And I was also very lucky to run into people in my career um, and through my life that for one reason or another kind of tucked me under their wing and helped me help me get through. People that personally have sponsored me and looked past many, many things um, to give me an opportunity. I do remember one of the very first conversations I had as a junior, consult, junior consultant uh, at a company I used to work for, and I was at the, my client's cafeteria, and I think I had been in the job for about three weeks, and my, my manager at the time leans into the table and looks at me and says, I don't know if we were going to make it. And that's exactly what you need to know as you, you know, three weeks into an H-1 visa, you know, working in the States, um, and I asked why and said, well, you clearly have a language barrier. And, um, and I spent many years then after I tried to perfect my, my accent. Um, but the reflection is that that shouldn't be the case, right? The reflection is that, you know, you, you shouldn't, we, all of us shouldn't have to rely on a combination of luck and privilege to advance in our careers and to be successful today. And what I wanted to do today is revisit a bit of that presentation, but do it in partnership with Aisha, because it is Aisha's group and it is Aisha's, Aisha's mission um, that helped me trigger this reflection. And I think Aisha and I are partnering um, together, at least within this, our immediate domain right now, a DocuSign. Um, how do we change that, right? And how do we continue to create opportunities, right, for everybody to succeed, right? Irrespective of, you know, some of the talents or sorry, the skills or the experiences or, or the barriers that they may have. So when I, when I was reflecting on my presentation, I basically talked about, you know, growing up, right? How do we, you know, every time, sometimes, you know, you make dinner, you know, for four and then, you know, three aunts and two uncles and, you know, five cousins will show up. And then, you know, my mom will say, well, don't worry, lechemos agua los frijoles. That's just a, a common, so we used to put more water in the beans and we will make room on the table, right? We'll pull up a chair, you know, we will like, you know, turn a paint bucket upside down and, and we just make it happen, right? And I was like, well, that's great. But again, how do we, how do we make it, how do we make it more programmatic? How do we make it so that it doesn't have to be a gargantuan, a, an heroic effort for people like us to advance and succeed in the current marketplace. And to that, um, that I, just, I just want to invite Aisha and say, hey, how do we do it, right? And how is she doing it? What is she working on uh, here at DocuSign? And what can we learn so that we can all try to do it together? So before I keep going, I just want to introduce Aisha again. And 
Aisha, why don't we why don't we get started and tell us a little bit more about you and, and your journey and, and, and who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and thank you so much to the high tech team, Mi Familia y Sigo Familia. Um, and so these slides uh, are pictorials of my story. Um, th this is absolutely um, pictures of what you will see and what my experience was, my lived experience uh, growing up in the inner city of Chicago, one of the absolute um, greatest cities on earth. And of course, yes, I am partial, um, but it is absolutely uh, one of the greatest cities, certainly that I've lived in thus far. And I've, I've lived in uh, 10 different cities in my time and my professional career. Um, but who, who I am at the core is an individual that is focused on what Enrique shared as it relates to a statement that his mom often made. Um, make room at the table, we will make room at the table. And that uh, mantra for me was a lived experience that was modeled by the two individuals um, in the middle of this slide who are um, showing up with their fists in the air. Those are my grandparents, Inez uh, Bowman and Alfred Bowman. My grandfather uh, worked for the city of Chicago until um, his death, as did my grandmother. She worked for the Chicago Police Department, and my grandfather did as well. But these were individuals who were always focused on making room at the table, not just at our familia table, but at the table of the community, which is really where my passion for the work that I do around people and employee experience and enabling a diverse, equitable, and inclusive organization came to be. But the work that I do is only as impactful as the legacy that I'm able to create, which is in uh, the picture of my three daughters, um, who are 5, 14, and 19, Hannah, Gabrielle, and Chloe. Uh, and that's a picture of us heading off uh, on a family vacation. And it shows that at the end of the day, what I am doing and what I'm looking to do is I'm watching the manifestation of what my grandmother and grandfather showed and shared with me is that making room at the table is oftentimes about creating a way and modeling the way for those that don't have a voice. And so the pictures of the buildings, the three white buildings, that is um, the apartment community that I grew up in. Uh, the building that is uh, a brown uh, building is the building that my father lived in right across um, the street from us. And it actually, if you go to Chicago today, is a community, specifically the brown building, it's, it's known as Ida B. Wells, it no longer exists. And so in moments in my career where I felt like I wasn't seen, um, I wasn't valued, I wasn't being heard, um, it reminds me of what exists in, in sometimes in communities where communities have to transform, but in that transformation, um, they may evolve from what was. How do you sustain that in the, the culture and the experiences that you grew up in and take that into your professional career? And that has been my plight uh, since going into the professional working world is how do I stay true to who I am? And if I were honest with each of you, it took me a very long time to find the courage uh, to share my voice, to lean into my voice, and to be comfortable with who I was as a professional that I had become. What I did was I uh, was the suit for the organizations that I, I was at. I looked like everyone else um, because that was what I was told. If you wanna be successful, you need to look this way, dress this way, talk this way, have this certain inflection uh, in your voice and make sure that you tone down that Southern accent that we hear. And unfortunately, there are people that still hear that today. And so my plight and my world, um, as I think about going and journeying into being an, a leader who enables and inspires and encourages authenticity is to make sure that all voices, regardless of the lived experiences are heard, valued and seen. And so I'll share more um, about how I came and stepped into that authenticity, but I will tell you in full transparency, it was hard. 
There were times when um, it was scary and there were absolutely times when it was uncomfortable. However, having mentors in the professional setting that pushed me to use my voice is what put me on the path to really move forward in leveraging my voice, not just for myself and my own growth, but for those that were uh, to come before me or those that I were, was given the responsibility to shepherd through leadership of a team. And so looking forward to being able to dig into that more, but that's just a little bit about a little black girl um, who grew up and was born to a 17 year old mother who decided to put off college until her daughter graduated college from an HBCU, and she then went back to get her degree. That's an example of how we make room at the table because sometimes it does come with sacrifice. And I can't wait to dig more into this in our discussion, Enrique. Yeah, I, I, I can't wait either. And and you know, we'll pull in that thread, but you know, your your concept of voice and, and your accent so much resonates with me and Aisha. I think I, I talked about this before. I'm not going to name or number uh, the number of decades in which that first conversation happened that I spoke about, but how it's only been the last three, four years where I personally said, you know what, I, I have an accent and I'm proud of it. I proudly roll my R's and, you know, and, and, and I embrace it because, you know, a lot of people have accents and, and use being comfortable being in your own body and speaking on your own voice and your accent uh, when you know um, everybody actually does understand you. Um, it's important to step into that comfort zone. Um, however, the, 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 the thread I, I want to pull next is, is something that you mentioned. And I think you said, it's like, you know, to be successful, you have to fit, right? How do you fit, uh, into that definition of success? And, and, and one of the topics that we talked about, uh, in November, it's, is about this concept of, of fit and cultural fit. And, Used to show an example, uh, and I'm pretty sure you know this is this is this this you can relate to this. I'm going to show a, a picture um, of my first meeting uh, working in the states. Um, that was that, that that's it's not a real picture, but I think you get what I'm trying to get to, right? You walk in, and I'm like, how am I going to fit in here, right? And to your point, it's like, how am I going to be successful? Right, and I think someone someone mentioned uh, in the call actually some someone yelled uh, in the presentation in New York. It's like, well, at least they're smiling. It's like, yeah, curiously is smiling. Um, but but this is this, this is some of the stuff and and you know some some of the pictures, some of the environment that that sometimes many of us uh, walk in, right? And and you know the the word, I mean those those three letters that come to mind many times is is the is this fit, right? How do I fit in? Because we correlate fit with success. And I think you have something to say about, you know, the whole element of, you know, cultural fit versus cultural ad. So what, why don't you tell us more about, you know, what you think about what fit is and what should be and what should not be. And I don't want to sell you a thunder, so. No, no, no problem. Um, so, so, so team, what I want to share is, uh, culture, according to the Society of Human Resource Management, it, it really defines the proper way to behave within an organization and consists of shared beliefs and values established by the leaders and shapes the employee's perception, their behaviors, and their understanding. At the end of the day, the net net is culture sets the context for everything an organization does. And so when Enrique speaks about it and he tees us up for this discussion of cultural fit, I want you to think about it in that frame of what I've just shared. Um, culture is defined by who? The leaders of the organization. It is around a shared set of values um, and behaviors that guide and govern the organization. But isn't it interesting how these new um, sets of information or terminology can, if you will, be diametrically opposed to what culture is meant to be. And so when you think about it from this perspective, I would say culture fit is diametrically opposed to what and how we define our culture. Because at the end of the day, the crux of our culture is connected to and embedded in the values that an organization shares. So dare I say, 
um, when you think about culture fit, that is definitely uh, something that connects to, you know, mentality of people that hire uh, with a particular set of skills, work styles, it reflects the company and the team's established culture and values, right? However, however, what may happen and may have happened um, in your experiences as, as you have progressed in your careers, depending on where uh, you are in, in your organization, your career trajectory, uh, sometimes it can be a, a familiar and a, a safe way of hiring talent, but it can absolutely reinforce biases that might be conscious or unconscious, spoken or unspoken. And so rather than thinking about culture fit and that language and that we often hear, I know I've sat in uh, rooms where we're going through candidates and um, a, 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 a teammate or colleague may say, well, I don't know if they're a culture fit. And when you probe more, it really, uh, it really is based on a person's perception of that individual versus what they can do to help progress the business results of the organization. So I would propose that we think about our talent from a perspective of how are they a culture add? How do they multiply and serve as an additional culture carrier of the overall organization's mission, vision, and values? How do we ensure that when we drive this culture ad um, focus, we continue to think about it from a perspective of promoting the growth opportunity where we may have gaps in our organization. It mitigates and minimizes the biases that inevitably will creep into um, hiring processes. It ultimately, fundamentally, is about the ability for an individual to add to a culture through innovation, diversity and growth. And so what I would say to you as you think about culture fit versus culture ad is to really go back to that definition of culture and think about the culture ad as being a multiplier to the culture or an amplifier of the organization and helping to bring to life those areas in the organization where the organization or company has yet to fully delve into, but with the talent that they are bringing in or might be bringing in, that individual or set of individuals serve as that additional amplifier that helps to fuel innovation, diversity, and growth. Thank you, Isha. So, so when we think about you know making room at the table, you know one of the things that we consider all the time, and and I think where where we would like to push the conversation, and frankly, not in a conversation, the practices and the standard into hiring for all corporations in the world, but let's just start with the states, it's about thinking about, you know, it's not about who fits in, but who adds, right? And how do we make this a compounding incremental effect into our culture? And I think that's very important. We take it very seriously here at DocuSign. I think that's something that's very important for us to make sure, right, we're not looking at, at people through our own lens, but through the lens of, you know, how can this be additive, right? And how can we live sometimes on that edge of discomfort, right? Because sometimes, you know, different can be discomfort, right? But you have to understand, right? We have to push ourselves, right? And this is like, how can we have cultural ads that really help, cultural ads that really help us, you know, improve and increase our reach as a company. So I think the next thing, and we talked about fit, and one of the things that we can continue to consider as you know, making room at the table, hiring more diverse candidates, is the point around experiences, right? And this is something, an experience, and this is something I do overuse the word experience myself, right? When you think about hiring, right? And when you think about our current hiring practices, and this is an invitation, more like an ask to all of you who can, is to Take a look at your job descriptions, right? Because this is the first thing that a candidate sees when they're considering joining our organizations is the job description. And the very first thing is like, hey, what, what are the minimum requirements, right? And when we think about the minimum requirements that I've seen in some places, right? This is 100% the definition of fit, right? And fit that is um, reinforcing a stereotype that may or may not be um, either um, additive to what we're looking for, but more importantly, inclusive enough. For example, 
right? The one on the left of the slide on the top left says 12 plus years of relevant experience for a, um, this is like a lower, like almost entry level job in technology. And it says 12 plus years of relevant experience. Um, let me tell you something. If that was the case for me, I would have never gotten the jobs that I got, right? Because I've been, I've been through conversations and believe me, I've been a hire, I am a hiring manager uh, and I had conversations where people say, well, where, where, are the, where are the candidates? And people say, well, you know, or where are the diverse candidates? And people tell me, well, you know, the requirements are 12 years of relevant experience working at, you know, name your favorite, you know, big technology firms working in enterprise or like, and my answer is like, you just basically describe a white male. So for us, you know, we have to really think about how do we make this even more and more inclusive and expensive. The other one, for example, is own, the other hand, own and quarterback, you know, all commercial activities. Think about this, quarterback, such is the ultimate white male <laughs> American uh, uh, term, right? You basically just alienated most, if not all, of females. So what if I don't want to be a quarterback, right? What if I don't like football? Or like me, I remember when I came into the States um, almost 20 years ago, I had to spend a full day, a full day in a classroom learning about a sport theme, a sport analogies as it related to, um, <laughs> to business terms. I was like, what does swinging for the faces mean? What is like, who's on first? Like, what's like all that kind of stuff, all those kind of things, like Monday morning quarterback. It's like, I, I, don't, I don't have no idea what you're saying. So for us to make room at the table is not only about, you know, thinking about ads versus fit. It's also about looking into the structural processes and the definitions that we have deeply ingrained in our organization that might be accidentally, right, excluding candidates. And I'll make the case that if we are really going to make run at the table, what we have to work on is start hiring for attributes versus acquire skill sets and experiences. I'll tell you, right, I am in enterprise software sales. One of the best people I ever had, you know, as a salesman, used to sell shoes and leather before I hired them. So think about those attributes. Instead of years of experience or, you know, whatever sports analogy, think about creativity, right? Think about collaboration, right? Think about resourcefulness, right? The ability to work with teams. So think about learning, a growth mindset. The opportunity, and if you can, pushing your organizations to make sure all of these definitions are changed. So we start hiring for attributes. Because this is the thing, right? If we add up, right, the minorities, just Hispanics, Hispanics and Blacks as, as a percentage of either the labor force in tech, right, and as leadership, we are not even close. I mean, we're, smil we're still less than the second largest group that participates. So this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. We have to increase the size of the slice in the pie. And the only way to do that, right, is by, again, thinking about how do we hire for attributes which could require experiences so we don't uh, create a self-fulfilling prophecy. So with that, what I want to say is uh, I want to transition now to Q&A uh, with Aisha because I have, a very, I have a bunch of very important questions that I want to ask you. Uh, okay. And I want to open it to questions uh, from the group. I'm conscious of time. But first okay. off, I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask the first question, and if we don't have more more questions, but I'm sure we will. I can ask a couple more. But is our first radio here? We talked about a bunch of things in front of a bunch of people, um, different audiences. But Aisha, um, why is it important for you to be here? Well, I mean, I it took me. I think when I when Susanna sent me the email, I don't know, it was like a few months ago. Um, it took me about two seconds to forward the email to Aisha and ask her to join. And it took her about two seconds to respond and say yes. So I don't know, what, why do you say yes? Why it's so important for you to be in this conversation? Yeah, um, it, it's as simple as this. Uh, given the role that I have uh, within uh, this, within DocuSign, but more importantly, uh, in the community, it's important that 
as we continue to grow in our careers is that we create more what I will call co culture carriers and culture ads to the organization. And we do that by engaging in real talk, authentic uh, dialogue and sharing our successes as well as our failures. And when we think about that slide that you just shared, I mean, we're talking about Hispanic tech leaders and looking at the portion of the population that reflects our Hispanic Latino population, we've got a great opportunity. And so the more we have conversations like this and share information based on our experiences professionally, but also bringing in uh, data and insights from other organizations, the more we can continue to create more individuals in leadership and opportunities for them to give back. At the heart of who I am as a leader, I'm a servant leader. And so when I'm asked a question to do this type of engagement or any other type of engagement for that matter, where we're able to talk uh, to talent and the, the leaders of um, this century and those in the, in the future, it's my responsibility to figure out what I can do to help. And so I'm here today to be a part of creating more runway and greater trajectory of leadership for our diverse talent across the globe. Thank you, Aisha. I think it's it's so important. Um, I mean, from my perspective, just to have leaders like you and to put yourself out there and and share your 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 journey. And and I mean, at least I don't know if myself, it's just inspiring. So, um, Susanna, are there any questions out there? Or does anybody have questions? I think I, we've clearly established early on that people can take themselves off mute. So yeah. this is and and knowing this group, I know they're not not shy. So if anyone, right, yeah, go ahead. And, and if you just want to, you know, chime in here, take yourself off mute and, and, and participate in the conversation, we would love that. Um, thank you, first of all, by, to both Aisha and Enrique for your time and your dedication to this, for making room at the table for different voices. Um, and I think one of the, the, the questions that I had just to get us started maybe was, Aisha, and this one's for you, like, what would you suggest for somebody who hasn't quite found their voice? Um, we deal with people, you know, from all different types of backgrounds and in and, and areas within high tech, uh, all passionate about technology. And although they might be subject matter experts in the field of data or cybersecurity or whatever, they might not necessarily feel comfortable because there isn't a seat at the table because everybody at the table doesn't, you know, quite look like them. Um, what would you say is a good kind of standard practice for them to start to develop that security in their own voice? Yeah, um, Susanna, thanks for that. I would start with this very first step is start with answering the question of what is my why? So to your point, uh, I am a subject matter expert in cybersecurity, subject matter expert in this. But what is your why behind that? What makes you the expertise? What gets, um, I, would, I would like to call it, what is your judge around cybersecurity? And how is that connected to your why? Beyond, but also including the passion for the space, but beyond the passion. And as you begin to delve into your why, your voice, and how you lean into the space and the work and partnering with others on your team and, and managers and leaders will begin to evolve. The other thing that I've done in my career is I've sought out um, and just have been a student of leaders in my organization. What do I mean by that? I watch those leaders that reflect diversity in its specific sense of reflecting the diversity that I reflect, but then also in its broadest sense and watch how they engage in the organization, how they lead in the organization, and begin to understand what has set them apart. Not to take on what they do, but to understand what of what they do is connected to who I am as a values-based individual and does not negate uh, or take me away from being able to sustain my integrity of who I am. In other words, where I don't feel like I'm putting on a show because I am trying to be this prototype of a leader. Lean into your why, study those leaders that you absolutely admire, think about what sets them apart, 
what of that connects to who you are as a values-based individual and sustains your integrity. And that, that's what I've leveraged uh, in my career as I began uh, and as I continue to grow, quite frankly, in my career. Thank you for that insight and for the encouragement. You know, that is super important. Um, we do have a hand raised. Feel free to take yourself off mute and ask away. Go ahead, Clarabel. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Aisha, I am here in Chicago and downtown Chicago right now. And yay, um, when, when you're here next, we'll have coffee. Um, I wanted to ask you about and kind of just going off of what you just shared, what about mentors? Uh, mentors, so I, I'm in an organization that's that's smaller than most um, and still just out of startup phase. Who do you seek out for mentors and what kind of mentors do you have in your organizations and outside of your organization? Yeah, um, and, I, and thank you for that question. So uh, the mentors that I have, um, I, I leverage a mentor very differently than a sponsor. So the mentor and my mentor community that I lean into, I'm leveraging them for very specific uh, needs or opportunities where I'm looking to, if you will, round out um, a particular professional development opportunity, or um, I'm just seeking another voice that's going to be honest and will pull no punches uh, because they know all of who I am. And those individuals come in the form of both peers. So you might want to think about who um, in your peer group you have a trusted relationship with, but also a relationship where you can both be mutually honest uh, with one another. And then also, um, I've always looked for mentors that have either been a level or two above where I wanted to go. Why am I pivoting on hierarchy? Listen, hierarchy is not necessary, or leadership, if you will, uh, is not just the one area that you would pivot on, but depending on what your development is or what your plan for development in your career is, you might leverage that approach of looking for individuals that might be a leader as defined by your organization. And then also, um, I, I have mentors that reflect my lived experience my personal lived experience. Finally, I have mentors that don't look like me. That is mission critical. And if I were to prioritize it, I would probably say that's first. You want mentors that don't look like you because as you think about many of our organizations, while we are growing in the diversity of our organization, certainly DocuSign is very much focused on continuing to drive diversity in our organization. And we're seeing that uh, continue to happen. We also know that in many other organizations, the population or the percentage, if you will, of that representation is still a great opportunity to improve. And so you think about individuals that are in positional power in your organization and you seek out their mentorship. And I've not had a person when I've reached out to say, no, I don't want to lean in and make time for you. Know that they will always make time. I think I, I, I'll just add to that, Aisha, um, is, you know, you absolutely should seek as many as and, and as diverse of a mentor sample as you possibly can, but but do reach out, right? I think one of the things that people usually say is like, how do I get a mentor? How do I find a mentor? Uh, I need to reach out. I mean, in my experience, as Aisha said, people usually say, yes, absolutely, right? People, you know, pe people love to, to help, right? Uh, at least that's in my experience. And, and they, they love to, in a way, share kind of those battle scars and their learnings through with the next generation, right? More often than not. So on top of everything that I usually said, which is phenomenal, it's just reach out to people um, and, and you'll be surprised about what you'll find. I saw another hand from and, Alejandro. And before yes, go ahead, I'll just I'll just add to that mentorship um, conversation because after all, this is high tech and this is what we are all about, right? Let's do a high five to that one. Um, it, we are the community and everybody here, we we have this kind of mantra where you leave your titles at the door and you are really open. Like, look at Benny. Benny is, yeah. it, I mean, he hasn't raised his hand to say, I'll mentor you, but let me tell you. I know he would because that's the type of person he is. 
That's a yes, I would. You see, but I know porque this is our heart. When Aisha was talking about the why, the why of everybody in this organization is exactly that. We are here to elevate, to support, and to make sure that you thrive wherever you are. So you are in the right place. Um, please feel free to connect to anybody within the organization. We are here to support you. And Alejandro, I'm sorry to, to take a little bit of time away, but I think it was important to just put that out. But please feel free, Alejandro, to take yourself off mute mm -hmm. and we'd love to hear your question. Of course, of course. And first, I, I want to give Enrique credit for practicing what he preaches. I mean, just a week ago, I was able to meet with him and I work here at DocuSign at a very entry level position here as an MDR and was able to actually meet with Enrique and he gave me actually 30 minutes of his time to be able to guide me on what I should do to, to, to get promoted, to take, to take myself to the next level. So I, I wanted to kind of chime in and let, let people know that it's definitely possible if you put yourself out there. Uh, but wanted to ask a question to, to, I, to Aisha. I know that in 2022, Hispanic Latinx were about 6.3% compared to 61% of, of the leader here at DocuSign. So what are some ways you think that we can make uh, the Latinx community feel more comfortable within the tech space. I know, like Enrique mentioned, you know, one of his best hires came from leatherworking. And I've seen that similar here in Los Angeles, you know, people that work at Foot Locker in sales or who work here in, in the garment district here in Los Angeles that are out, you know, selling people face to face that I see that have huge potential in tech. How can we make, how can we make them feel more comfortable within tech and let them, let them know that it's possible and they don't, you know, not necessarily have to have the same background as other ethnicities. So curious if you have any ideas on that. Yeah, Alejandro, thank you um, for that question. So I'll start with what Enrique offered early in our uh, conversation is the evolution to pivoting on attributes versus uh, what what is uh, required as skills. So really looking at attributes as one way that we began to create a broader portfolio and pipeline of diverse talent. Secondly, um, particularly as, let me just focus in um, and zero in on DocuSign, what we are doing are things like today. Today is an example of how we uh, continue to broaden and extend our pipeline, being able to amplify who and what we are, um, sharing and, and, and evolving and engaging our leaders in conversations like this. Now, while we're talking to a tech community, this tech community can then go and talk to their community about, hey, I got to meet leaders from or individuals from DocuSign and here's what they're all about. So in other words, we're creating that amplifier or that amplification of individuals that will want to become brand ambassadors for DocuSign through partnerships like high tech. We've also got other um, opportunities where we're frankly leaning in and partnering with organizations like Europe, where we are creating those experiences for talent to come in to our organization, do internships, gain those skills, but more importantly, the experience of working in tech, such that we hope it will create a multiplier effect where we create even more diversity within our pipeline, whether we're pivoting on Hispanic Latino talent or other underrepresented populations within the organization. Thank you so much, Aisha. I'm very happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro, for coming up. I will add to um, kind of the applause to Enrique. Enrique, eh, you started off the, the conversation talking about your accent and talking about how you had to go to uh, training to learn all the sportsisms that that we use. Um, but I also know you to be authentically yourself. And um, being a person who's in sales, I, I, I feel like that authenticity is number one requirement because BS can be smelled a mile away. Um, how have you been able to mold in, but yet continue to keep la esencia of who you are, which is obvious, you know, you're reaching, Alejandro's reaching out, you're, you're right there, you're one of the High Tech 50 awardees year over year, you are at the top of, of the industry, but yet you still make time, and in your day-to-day, -day, how do you weave in your Hispanic authenticity into your role? Just... Well, 
first off, you're 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 making me blush here. Um, incredibly, I, I I don't know what to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think, listen, um, that's a great question, and and I do want to get to Benny's question as he raises his hand, he raises his hand, but I think at the end, we are all humans, right? And and that is what's like where, where I think about how am I able to you know connect? I mean, one of the things that, that I feel like I I sometimes can do is just connect with people, and and the the key word there being people. Right, um, and I think you're focusing on the on the humanity, right? I think if you try to put a facade or you know that something that you know doesn't represent who you are, right, and you start getting away from your own humanity and your own essence, and 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 as you said, pe people hear that, people smell that, people see it, people sense it, and the most important thing in any relationship is trust. And I think that if you present yourself as someone else that is not who you are, immediately you are breaching that trust and, and people will have a hard time therefore trusting you. So to me, it's at the core, understand well humans and, and you know, honor that I, I, I come in with a sense of, you know, I, I have this person's trust and, and I can do everything I can to keep it, right? And, and to maintain it and to grow it. And to that, I just have to show, show who I am, right? So, so that's what I did. And I think you mentioned about, you know, yeah, I, I have an incredibly supportive family that, uh, you know, always keeps me honest, right? And always reminds me um, where we all came from and, and who I am. And that also, that, that always, you know, helps me and gives me that extra motivation to make sure I am, I am indeed serving you know, the community. So thank you. Uh, I, I won't pass it on to, to Benny because you're, you're making me blush here, but uh, Benny, ask your question. <laughs> yeah, more, more to add to what you're saying than necessarily a question. A story, Enrique, that maybe you will relate to a little bit. So it was my second assignment. I had a manager who um, was my boss and pulled me into a meeting room and was reviewing a memo that I wrote. And uh, for those of you that know, I'm, I'm from Puerto Rico. Spanish was my first language. Um, this was, you know, my first job in the, in the U.S., perhaps, uh, is the way, a uh, different way of looking at it. And he says, you know, your memo is not written properly. He was an English major. And so I said, I think you're wrong. <laughs> let me pull the dictionary and let me show you how. It's correct. And um, the reason I tell you a story, sometimes you have to make sure that you are worthy of being invited to the table. After that, he never corrected me again on my grammar or my English. Um, and, you know, I, I felt like I had uh, more participation uh, in the organization. And sometimes as a leader, it goes the other way. So my very first assignment, I walked into, quote, my office. And there's some of my associates, they're at my table. I'll date myself here. They were looking through a dictionary. And I asked them, what are you doing? He says, Benny, sometimes when you talk, we don't know what you're saying. So these were entry level associates and I would speak in very formal words and they didn't know what the heck I was saying. So I had to adjust and tone down my communication in order to be able to be more engaging with them. And they really appreciated that. And then, you know, so from a leader perspective, I earned their trust because I was willing to do my part to be a better communicator uh, with them. And that was also part of uh, them, you know, making me part of their table, if you will. So I just wanted to add those couple stories uh, to, to share in, in what you're um, letting us learn about. Thank you. Totally can, I can totally relate to that. Um, Susanna, I want to do a quick time check. I, uh, where, how are we doing here? Trying to get off mute. We are almost at time. So if anybody has one final question um, to add to the conversation, if not, then I am going to thank Enrique and Aisha so much for your time. Um, to build in to the community. We always talk about how we build into one another. Um, I believe that one of the ways that anybody, no matter where you are in the pipeline, you can be an authentic leader.
by taking the learnings that you have received today and in any moment, in any situation, you can show up and either yourself be authentic or encourage those around you. When we talk about the culture ad, Aisha, that you had had talked about earlier in your presentation, building your authenticity from the ground up at any level that you might be is that cultural ad. It, do, it does you know, start at the top, but you also represent the culture of not only your why, but also your brand, your organization at all times. So being your authentic self, I believe, lends itself to opening up the door for others to feel empowered to be their authentic selves in your presence. Uh, gracias to DocuSign, one of our uh, long lasting partners. We are greatly appreciative for the help that you do and the work that you do in this space. Muchísimas gracias. I do have to say that our next High Tech Live is going to be equally as impactful. Um, it's going to be presented to you by Cisco. Please go ahead and register, sign up for that one, uh, and stay tuned for all of the amazing lineup that we have for you this year. We have uh, some stuff from K, uh, from JP Morgan Chase, the Force for Good team, that, that, that how they helped us uh, transition to our new website. If you haven't seen it yet, please go check it out. Mil gracias a todos. I will let Enrique and Aisha close us out with a few um, parting words. Aisha, anything you want to say? Yeah, uh, the only thing I would say is uh, thank you. And just three things from my journey to authentic leadership. Um, I want to share that it will take sacrifice. It will take commitment. But the outcome of that will be being known for an individual that not only makes space at the table, but invites others to the table. Thank you, Risha. Uh, thank you, Rod. It's such an honor and a privilege being here. I, I just want to finish it with, I guess, one picture. We saw the first picture, but I think for us, definition of success, this is how the board meeting should look like. And I can't wait for that day when we make room for everybody at the table. Thank you so much. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias. See you all next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hasta luego. Gracias. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias a usted.